Hello everybody, this is Bob Campbell from On One Software's European office. Um, I'm going to be taking you through perfect black and white um, in this training session. And um, we're going to end up with the picture that you can see on your screen, which is of a place called the Triangular House in uh, Northampton, not that far from where I live in the middle of um, England. Um, so we'll get to that um, in a bit. We'll start with a different image and that's this picture of Abbeville Church. And this is just an image that I took on holiday. Um, so it's, it's pretty basic stuff. But what I want to do is to use it as an example of how to do quite a few of the processes inside of Perfect Black and White, okay? So I'm working in Perfect Layers. Um, I'm working in actually in Perfect Photo Suite 7.5, starting in Perfect Layers, and we'll move into Perfect Black and White in a minute. As you no doubt know, Perfect Black and White is one of the components of Perfect Photo Suite 7.5. You can use Perfect Black and White inside of Photoshop. You can work with it in Photoshop Elements, Aperture, or Lightroom. Um, so you've got lots of different choices. I'm going to be using it in its basically standalone mode as part of the suite. So we go from layers straight into perfect black and white with a single click and that converts the image into a grayscale uh, picture, uh, if you like a factory preset. And then from that factory preset we can decide to work in a couple of ways. The first is we can decide to use one of lots of different presets, just under a hundred presets that on one software have developed for perfect black and white. And you can see a few of them now in the browser on the left hand side of the screen. Each of these presets has been designed to simulate a particular type of effect. In fact, you can see them in this mode inside of the browser where we can view it in a single column, double column, or even a triple column view. You'll notice some of the flags are white and the flags bottom right hand corner of each of the little thumbnails means that I've selected those highlighted flags, the white flags, as favorite effects and they appear in my favorites. I tend to do that a lot with um, On One Software's products where presets are used because it means you kind of simplify the process of choice um, so you don't have to run through hundreds of different presets in perfect effects, perfect portrait or perfect black and white. You can just select the ones that you like to use most and they're a good starting point for you. For instance, a single click on palladium gives me a palladium type effect, um, a very old-fashioned uh, type of effect. It comes complete with a frame and of course if you don't want that frame then you can take it off. All you need to do is to go over to the right side the control panels of the software and just run down until you get to border. You'll notice border at the moment is switched on because that's one of the components of this particular preset. Just switch it off if you don't want it. Or if you want a different kind of border, switch it back on, go into categories. I like some of the emulsions for instance, so just go to emulsion, select an emulsion, and now we have a nice soft edge around the um, frame. Okay, So those are presets and we have lots of them. Uh, for instance, 20th century presets. If I just go back to the top and minimize 19th century processes, Let's take a look at some of the 20th century classic silvers. Now these little thumbnails in a three column view for me are a little bit small. A better way of viewing these is actually a new feature of Perfect Photo Suite 7.5. It's a grid view. You can see at the bottom of this set of presets that we have a little grid. Just click on it and all of the images appear with their grid view. Okay, so I can change the size of these, so I can reduce them in size so we can see a few more on the page, or I can keep them nice and big, and it gives me a perfect representation of what the image will look like. For instance, in this 20th century classic silver, single click, applies it into my image. Okay, so there it is. So this is a quite a grainy um, preset. 
Uh, it's quite nice because it's contrasty. Um, it's got a vignette on it by the looks of it, so I can see a little more of the sky. So it's completely changed the uh, idea of the image and the way the image looks. Now this preset is made from a variety of different settings on those little panels on the right hand side of the screen. Um, for instance, the uh, brightness and contrast looks as though it hasn't been adjusted at all, but if I take the preset and then start to adjust it myself using contrast and brightness sliders, adjusting the highlights and the shadows in the image by adjusting blacks and whites sliders. I have shadows and highlights again that I can correct in the image and I can apply more detail into the image. So now what I've done is to use the basic preset that I selected and now I've made some adjustments to it. So I'm using the preset as a kind of starting point, if you like, to adjust the image. Now you'll notice that all of these corrections with sliders on the right hand side of the screen adjust the whole picture. So for instance now I've clicked on an infrared color response filter. It's darkened the sky to almost black and it's increased the intensity of the contrast on the image. I have a red filter, an orange filter. What we're doing here, of course, is representing the filters, the color filters that you would have used on the um, end of your lens to shoot the original black and white image using black and white film. So lots of different controls there. Of course, I have a tone curve. The tone curve would normally be a diagonal line on the factory preset from top right to bottom left of the uh, little window, but here, this tone curve, this little shallow S shape, is dictated by the preset from the left hand side. So we've started to adjust the image using a series of presets and a series of controls on that right hand side that change the preset that we've applied to you or supplied to you. If I click glow on, these little rocker switches by the way just switch a particular part of the effect on and off. It couldn't be simpler. I can increase the amount of glow. Now it looks really ethereal and ghostly and strange. Um, a lot of the details disappeared from the image, but that glow is pretty amazing. I'll reduce that glow back down. In fact, I'll switch it off and we'll carry on looking down the side of um, <clears throat> these panels. So for instance, film grain. I said this was a grainy preset. Well, I can certainly see some film grain in there and it's actually 400 ASA Kodak T-Max. And I can adjust the amount of grain in there, or the amount of the effect that we apply to the image. And I can change the size of the grains to make them bigger or smaller. And I have a lot of different film grains to choose from. So for instance, 400 ASA Fuji Neopan, Ilfa Delta, uh, minus one, plus two, minus N. Kodaks, uh, lots of different types anyway. A lot of these you'll recognize if you're my age, incredibly old. Um, from times when we used to develop images in uh, black and white dark rooms. Okay, I can just as easily switch the film grain off if I don't want it, so it makes the image look smoother. Then I have toners. Now what are toners? Well let's switch them on to see what they do. And of course what they're going to do is to simulate the effect of printing onto coloured stock. So in this case the paper or the highlights are a kind of cream colour. Okay. And the silver, or the shadows, are a kind of, I would suggest, Prussian blue. Okay, something like that, anyway. If I click on Paper Highlights Color, I get a color palette, and I can change the color. So now we have a kind of very, very lime green paper color, okay? And now it's gone blue, and as I pull it through the spectrum of colors, you can see it changing as I work. It's brilliant to be able to do that so simply to uh, your images. I'll just say OK to this particular one, so it's a slightly warmer cream colour now. And the silver is still that nice dark Prussian blue. OK, and again I can change the amount of colour or reduce the effect on the image. So, we've taken a preset 
And now we've adjusted it amazingly. We've got something, I think, that's starting to look quite nice. You might disagree. I think it looks wonderful. But then I am colorblind. <laughs> OK. So we've got a kind of duotone effect almost now. Now, that I said the vignette was on. I'm just going to reduce it a little bit to pull it off that sky. The sky looks just a little bit too dark. All of these controls are just the vignetting that I want to give an image. Why do we want to vignette? A black and white image anyway. Well, when you convert it to monochrome from the original color image, sometimes it's difficult to see the edge of the image accurately. So for instance, a light blue sky, like the original image from here, kind of drifts off into the, in, into the ether. I prefer to kind of hold the pixels back into the image as far as possible. Border, I'll keep the borders off, I think. And then last but not least, I have sharpening options. And I've got, as you'd expect, progressive, high pass, and unsharp mask. If I want to sharpen my black and white image now, then I can. OK, so all of these effects are being applied globally to the picture as I work. OK, what if I want to apply an effect to a particular part of the picture? Well, let's see. Let's see how we do that. One thing I'd like to do with this, there's a couple of areas that I really want to improve the image quite a bit. And first of all, I'm going to go to Tone and take down the Detail slider back to zero. The image now looks a lot flatter. I don't like it like this. I do want to see some detail in there. But how can I add detail into parts of the image that really need it? For instance, if I put detail across the whole picture, I'll boost it up to 100%. The whole image looks like it's so detailed, it almost looks like a kind of uh, pencil drawing. And I know that to be true because I can draw like this if I really wanted to. I used to draw like this at college. Um, so very fine pencil detail. But I don't want to see as much detail, do I, as the, at the top of the church spire as there is, say, at the bottom in this fantastic stonework. I can see every lichen and... and you know, stain from, from years and years of rain and weathering. I can see every detail in there. It's fantastic. But there's too much detail for the whole image. So let's pull it back to zero. And now move over to the most powerful tools, I think, in the entire suite of what perfect black and white is. And I'm going to use the detail brush. It's the third brush down. When I activate a brush by clicking on it, I get a series of controls along the top of the screen. You'll recognize these from Perfect Effects. You'll recognize them from Perfect Portraits and other programs in the suite, including Perfect Layers, of course. Um, I can apply, first of all, as far as mode goes, top left-hand corner, more detail or less detail. I'm trying to figure out why I'd need less detail in this. I definitely want more, so I'll go for the standard setting. I'm going to increase the size of the brush. I have a size changer at the top of the screen with a little Wacom control next to it. If I activate that W by clicking on it, the Wacom or Wacom tablet that I might be using, depends on the part of the world that you come from for the pronunciation, will now control the size of the brush interactively. That's going to do absolutely nothing for me because I'm using a mouse. So I'll switch the W off. Feather, of course, controls the thickness of the brush and also the softness of the edge of the brush. It's all down to something called anti-aliasing, which is a little bit technical. Uh, but it's nice to be able to control the softness of the brush. Often you'll notice when I'm doing presentations, I'll use a soft brush to do masking. I'll use a soft brush on perfect effects and quite a soft brush on black and white. That feather is important to me. The amount slider up here controls the opacity of the effect that we apply. Just click on amount and then you get the little double-headed arrows as you do with feather, size, etc. And you can adjust the amount of opacity of the individual stroke. Okay, And there's a W next to that as well. Click on that and your Wacom pen then controls, or your Wacom pen, then controls the opacity of the stroke, okay? Now the perfect brush is wonderful. It's a little box that has a tick or a check mark in it, and once you see that, you'll be able to control where you're applying an effect. Let me explain. 
First thing I'm going to do though is the detail, more detail, okay? Now the more detail brush I'm going to reduce in size by clicking on the bracket keys. I could use the size changer up here but the bracket keys I'm quite used to similar to the kind of control for a brush size in Photoshop or Photoshop Elements. I'm going to reduce the amount of the effect. Well, no, let's put it up to 100%. So you can really see the effect. Remember, that's controlling the opacity of the individual stroke. Let's apply it thick so that you can very clearly see what this brush is doing. It's painting that detail that we applied originally with the detail slider but I'm painting it into specific parts of the image. Remember, I don't want the top of the tower very detailed. That wouldn't make sense to my eyes, and I'm sure it wouldn't look good on the finished print. But here, the detail slider going in at 100% is plastering detail into the marks I'm making with the brush. Okay. Now, I'm going to undo those marks because it is too intense. So I'm just going to go back and gradually pull back those detail brush strokes that I've made. I used the command Z or control Z to undo brush strokes. Of course I have unlimited undo and I could use the edit pull down menu but I'm not going to. I prefer to use some of the keys on the keyboard. Now change the amount. I'm going to pull that back to about 20% because that really ferocious amount of detail is really too much for me. Let's click, click, click. You'll hear the mouse button going in the background from this recording. And I'm just plastering, or I'm, no, I'm not plastering. I'm very carefully placing the position of the detail. I'm actually looking at the shadows, you know. There are some, be this was a beautiful sunny day when I took the shot. And I was quite happy to see all of this contrast in the image straight out of the camera. If you start to put too much detail into the lighter areas of an image, you'll see more brickwork, for instance, and stonework. But it doesn't look so natural because you would expect it to be burnt out by the intense sun of a, of a Normandy uh, midday. This church is in, uh, on the river um, Somme, in fact, I think. In, am I right there? I might be wrong. We did a tour of France and my geography is pretty poor. Anyway, I like that detail. Now what I'd like to do is to make the sky a little bit darker. I've got the vignette, top right hand corner's looking good, but I'd just like the sky a fraction darker. How can I do that? Click on this little pipette tool. Okay, and this gives you a targeted brightness control. So, just move the cursor over to the sky in this case, and we've got a little crosshair. Okay, click with the mouse button, turns into two arrows, and if I push to the right hand side, the whole sky goes lighter, despite the fact it's, you know, several different tones. If I push over to the left-hand side, the sky goes darker. Not completely black, but it goes quite a bit darker. So I'm going to pull it over a little bit, so we've got a little bit of contrast in there, but it's a little bit darker than it was. Subtle, but really nice. A beautiful tool to use. Now, what are the two top brushes? We missed those. Brightness brush. Okay, so I can brighten a selective part of the image, so I can lighten or darken, okay? I'm going to go to darken, and I'm going to show you something really clever. I'm going to switch the perfect brush option off, and I'm going to increase the size of the brush. A little bit oversized, okay? I'm going to use the darken mode. The setting for the opacity is at 20%, that's probably okay. And I'm going to click and darken the side of that buttress on the left-hand side of the church tower. Now it's darkening beautifully. What's the problem? Well, there's a big problem. Because the brush is so big, I should have used a smaller brush, clearly. I probably should have zoomed in to get some really accurate shadow in there that wouldn't affect the front face of the buttress where we've got a lot of bright sunlight and of course the sky. So it's a terrible bit of retouching, I apologize for that, but I'll fix it now. Because with a couple of undos, Command Z, Control Z, I'm just using the keyboard again, I'm now gonna switch the perfect brush 
option on with that little check or tick mark in the box. Now, with the target in the middle of the brush, that little minus sign that you can see, or hyphen, keep that hyphen or minus sign in the area that you want to darken, and click and darken. Now, how clever is that? The perfect brush constrains the effect into the area covered by the little target mark inside that brush. I think that's gorgeous, don't you? It's so clever. Look, I'm going to darken it again. I'm so pleased with it, I'm going to go mad with the darkening. And there it is. The minute I go outside the area, look, suddenly that front face starts to darken, which of course I don't want it to do. I want to maintain the high level of contrast on the image. I might want to add a little bit more detail or contrast into that face because it is really quite blown out. But right now, I'm reasonably happy with the way that's working. The Perfect Brush is beautiful. It's a fantastic addition to Perfect Photo Suite 7. Now, I've made a couple of brush strokes and that's fine. But what I've done, in essence, to the whole image is to adjust a lot of things using the slider. Remember, I started with a preset, 20th century classic silver. I've got 21st century modern digital and quite a few others besides, OK? There's almost 100, I think, different presets. Now, because I took an original effect and then adjusted it using the slider controls on the right-hand side, perhaps I like this effect enough to save the preset. So I'll do it now. Preset. Save preset, and I can give this a preset name. I'll call it Abbeville. I've got to remember how to spell it. It is French, so I do get confused. Abbeville Church Preset. OK. I now need to choose a category where I can save my preset. And you'll notice I've already got some here. I can go to, say, Churches, for instance. Or if I want to, I can say Add New Category where I just create a complete new place to put uh, effects that might be to do with forests, for instance, or mountain landscapes, or rivers, or something like that. In this case, I'll stick with churches. The creator, of course, is Bob, and that's me. And the description is really nice 20th century preset adjusted and then blah, 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 blah. OK, so we decide what we want to put in there. Now, the reason I might want to put some stuff in there is because I might want to send this preset to a friend if I'm so pleased with it and they've got the suite as well. You can email the presets around. The same goes for perfect effects as well. So let's just say create Abbeville Church preset category is churches. OK, now at the top of the browser, we have the effects that we've been previewing already. We have favorites, I've saved lots of favorites, and we have my presets. And under churches, I have, um, let's just make this a single column so I can read these, Abbeville Church preset, okay? There's a preset that I saved, which really makes the church look as though it has been drawn, but I'll use the Abbeville Church preset in particular. Right, how can I see this preset working? Well, let's just go to Edit and say Reset All. Edit Reset All takes me back to the factory preset. So I've just reset the whole thing. OK. Now, how do I apply my Abbeville Church preset that I've just created? And I might want to use again and again and again. Single click. Perfect. I've got the right amount of um, contrast in there, the sky's looking good, and of course I've got that nice um, duotone effect with the toner, the paper highlight toner. Okay. If I need to put the detail back in there, I will have to brush that in. And because it's brushed in in a specific part of the image, it won't save in the preset, but that's a very simple job and a simple task to adjust the detail. In fact, I'll put a little bit of detail in there now. Just to prove the point, it really is a piece of cake. And just put a little bit of detail in there, that's fine. And then if I want to darken off that side again of the... Just go there and darken, darken, darken. Remember using the magic brush. 
absolutely fine. It takes no time at all to finish off the image. And then I just apply the effect back into, in this case I'm going back into perfect layers because I'm using the suite in standalone mode. You might decide to save this back if you're using uh, perfect black and white as a plugin into your Photoshop CS456 and Creative Cloud or um, your uh, perfect, uh, ooh, perfect, what am I talking about? Or your uh, Photoshop, that's it, that's what I was looking for, Photoshop Elements and your um, Lightroom and Aperture, okay? So here I am back in perfect layers. Now what we'll do then is to find my images um, from the triangular house, okay? So let's just open up those and I'll open them in the grid mode so that you can see all of these shots. A little bit about the triangular house. It was built in 1593 um, by a gentleman called Tresham, who was a Catholic uh, landowner in England. And under Elizabeth I, of course, he couldn't practice his uh, religion. So his uh, protest for that was to develop or build this amazing place which is a triangular house it's just got three sides or three walls um, and what you've got with those three walls of course is a um, the idea that it represents the Holy Trinity three yeah Father Son Holy Ghost I guess you can see I'm desperately religious um, and what we're going to do, obviously, is to take his house, I'll discuss it a little bit as we carry on, and turn it into a black and white image. So I'm going to say new to this, and I won't bother saving the church. So the, the amazing thing about this place is it has so much detail. Let me just zoom in for you so you can see, um, just on that window. Look at the little triangles that make up the, the window frame, almost. Um, is this a true foil effect. Um, everywhere you look around here there are little triangles. Let's, let me just move around the screen. So you know everything has got three sides to it almost. Um, the bits at the top there are little triangles everywhere. Again more triangles on the windows. Everything is three. The whole building is just three-sided so it's a, it's a crazy idea. And no idea where you get furniture for that by the way. Um, but anyway we have our picture. I'll just fit the image on the screen. This is a layered image, by the way. I created a new sky. Um, the original sky on this was a fairly flat blue. Um, you can see it just in the browser on the left-hand side. So I put a, um, an extras sky in it, a sky provided by On One Software with the suite that you can use uh, yourself and cut a little mask for it. And so we want to make it black and white. Single click on perfect uh, B&W. And there is my image in black and white. And all I'll do with this, actually, is just to run through the kind of processes that I would normally use to make the image look interesting. Now, a good monochrome image should have very little deep, deep black shadow and very few areas where the image is burnt out to white. Um, I've done competition work with a couple of um, clubs here in the UK and they insist that there must not be too much jet black and too much bright solid white in an image. And with the software, of course, if you move over from on the right hand side of the screen from navigator through to histogram and then click on the little arrow, you can see the areas in this case represented by blue, which are the deepest blackest areas of the picture. We need to try and remove those as far as possible. You can get by with a little bit of jet black in an image, but it doesn't always uh, pay, especially if you're entering a competition, for instance, so you're a member of a, a camera club. Um, so I'll just switch that off, go back to the navigator window, and I'll select, I think, the um, brightness brush just to lighten a couple of specific parts of the image where those trees were and where you saw with the histogram that there is some pretty black areas. So I'll just lighten up the trees. You can see now the areas. I'm clicking on the uh, bottom right-hand corner behind the building. You can see the shrubbery 
it's a it's a yew tree I think so it's actually very dense uh, not the perfect kind of image to use probably in an image but now we've got a lot of uh, extra information there now these areas on the right hand side and yeah the branches are lightening up quite nicely I'll switch the perfect brush option on because I don't want to brighten up the edge of the building itself but I just want to and I'm clicking quite fast and furiously because look I've only got uh, opacity on 20% I don't want to put it on too heavy if I do for instance move it up to something heavy like this suddenly patches of bright light will start to appear it will be just too intense let's go up to a hundred and look oh bad 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 subtlety is the key with as much of this as possible okay you can't make an image out of total black or total white um, if the camera just had, and this was a bright day again a very bright sun, sunny day in Northamptonshire this was this is a real rarity now I'm going to reduce the amount a little bit more and I'm just going to move in to this area of these stones okay just let the screen refresh for you so it takes up all the pixels bring in the brush tool uh, the light and brush in this case and just increase the size and now I'm going to increase the feather because I want this to be a soft brush now just lighten very gradually let's take the amount down a little bit more because we're zoomed in I just want to be able to see a fraction more detail I'll just pull the amount up a little bit so you can see it changing and gradually pull a little bit of detail back into the side of those steps because it looks a little bit dark and dingy down there and I just want to be able to show you that there is detail in there. However subtle, there is still detail, okay? Great. Let's try a little bit just on the doorway. Oh yes, now I can see the woodwork of the door a lot clearer. That's nice, nice, nice. Okay, let's refit the image on the screen. I'm going to go to my detail brush. What's the second brush down? Contrast. More contrast, less contrast. I think this image looks quite contrasty. I'm not going to adjust contrast, don't really need to. I will darken down the sky a bit, so I'm going to use this little tool to just show a few more highlights. Oh yeah, that's lovely. It really brings out the, the, the clouds a little bit more. So that targeted brightness tool is fantastic on skies. I always use it on skies. Good for landscapes as well, and you know, soft rolling hills and things like that. Detail. I want detail. I want to see detail. I'll switch the perfect brush off because I don't want to limit the area. I just, oh, look at it suddenly. Oh, you can almost touch that pointy bit of the building. Pointy bit of the building. You can see I was originally an architect. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't honest. I'm using the detail because, you know, there is so much detail in this building, it is amazing. I'll just limit the size of the brush and go to this, I would call him a little gargoyle, I think, that's got the holding the drain. And I've got to put a fraction more detail in there as well, and just over the door. The detail brings out this amazing banding of the stone that they, they've used an iron stone to build this, or Tresham used an iron stone to build in, in alternate layers. So we've got limestone, and iron, the ironstone is honey coloured. It's the most glorious. You see some of the old villages. If you ever get outside of um, London, if any of you visit uh, the UK, just get out to Northamptonshire. The villages are the prettiest you'll ever see. Outside of where you live, of course, which I'm sure is fantastic. So detail, detail, detail. Do I need a vignette? I don't think I do. I think I'm pretty happy with the way that looks now. I've applied some lovely detail in there. I've brightened up the image in a couple of places where it just needed a bit more. I'm not going to lighten the highlights because obviously we've got some tree shading on the image itself. The sun was coming in from the left hand side quite high up. Um, I think that's looking quite nice. How about a little bit of brightening perhaps? <coughs> Excuse me. A little bit of lightning just on the grass at the front. So I'm going to increase the brush big time and just pull out a little bit of lightning 
lightning. Sounds like thunder and lightning, doesn't it? Just brighten up that grass at the front. Not to make it look as though it's not in shadow, because of course it was, but just brighten up the path a little bit, which accentuates almost the triangular nature of the image. I hope you like that. I, I think, i got to say, Perfect Black and White is a fantastic um, addition to uh, Perfect Photo Suite. And as an independent program in its own right, I think it's wonderful to use. It's, it's reaffirmed a love I had for black and white many, many years ago at college, but now I actually think it's far better because it's just so much more accessible and I don't have to mess around with those smelly chemicals. Okay, so thanks very much for listening, everybody. Hope you have a nice day and watch out for more webinars from us. Cheers.